this is the last talk of the day. Oh, but it's okay because we have actual Tom. <laughs> yes, I'm. I am definitely sure that this is actually Tom Eastman. Um, Tom is a senior systems software no, engineer. No, got it wrong. No, what are you? What are you? Senior software systems engineer. I didn't even make it up. He is known like for a though. gentleman programmer of leisure. He has a real job now at Coordinates. And he is going to be speaking today about the exquisite, dangerous art of uh, safely handling user uploads. So let's make Tom feel welcome. Hi. I'm sorry, I really like doing that. It's fun. Um, I guess I should start by explaining why I was inspired to give this talk. So I'm not a hacker or, or a penetration tester by trade. I'm a developer, right? Like, like most of us here. I build things, and I like helping other people to build things. So my interest in computer security isn't born of wanting to be a hacker. It's kind of more born from a constant crippling anxiety about screwing up and letting people down. And so that's definitely not a healthiest, healthy approach, I think you'll agree, but it's, it's kind of a motivating one at least, right? So, so when it comes to web application development, I've always known that handling user uploads is tricky. Um, but until recently, I'd managed to kind of mitigate the risk by not bothering. Um, the most effective way possible, basically. Avoid having to do it uh, under as many circumstances as possible. Uh, more recently, though, I have been working on projects that do actually require you know, doing user-uploaded files, either because they have data ingest or they handle images of a certain type. And I made a couple pretty unpleasant realizations kind of along the way. So the first thing is getting it right is actually kind of harder than I expected. Um, most of my uh, web development experience is using Django, actually. All of it, frankly. All, all of it is Django. Django's got a really good reputation when it comes to secure web application development. You're well protected from the uh, most common security pitfalls that you end up having to deal with. Its uh, object relational mapper makes it really difficult to write code that's susceptible to SQL injection. Uh, its template engine gives you really good, strong auto-escaping by default, making it a lot harder to write code that's susceptible to cross-site scripting attacks. Not impossible, because cross-site scripting is a really hard one to deal with, but you're in pretty good shape by default. And of course, the built-in user authentication and session management capabilities are really well designed in Django, and they follow really good, secure, best practices. So with Django, the defaults keep you pretty safe. Right out of the gate, you're shielded from the worst of the OWASP, 10, um, the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. So let me just do the thing that I often do, which is um, who in this room has heard of the OWASP top 10 and kind of knows their way around it as a web developer? If you're not a web developer, it's a little less important, but it is interesting. So if you are a web developer and you're not familiar with the OWASP top 10, Google it as soon as you're done with this talk. Find the OWASP wiki, read up on the top 10, OWASP top 10. If, you don't, if you're not aware of these security vulnerabilities, you're a liability to your projects that you work on. And this is fixable because you are educable people and you can learn how to protect your users. So, and of course, the top 10 isn't all you need to worry about, but it's a good start and it'll make you a much better developer. So anyway, to my surprise, when I was dealing with file uploads with Django, I kind of discovered that Django's default settings can actually be problematic in some ways. Not necessarily insecure, but geared towards getting you up and running fast, and not necessarily putting safety first. So if you're a Django developer, this will look pretty familiar to you. This is two lines from your settings file and a couple lines from a models file. And in practice, this is all you need to start doing file uploads in a Django uh, web app. The problem with this example is that behind the scenes, the defaults expect you to be saving files directly to a location where they'll be hosted. That uh, media root. Um, URI, for example, is expected to be hosted by the web server right away. And I'll be explaining in this talk why that's a terrible, terrible idea. So the other thing I realized was, if you get it wrong, the scope for damage is eye-widening. Uh, a little bit of clever manipulation could see files saved to locations you didn't expect, uh, leading to exploitation of the server that it's running on. A misconfigured web server could be led to execute code included in user-uploaded files. It's a bad thing. 
a malicious file can cause programs parsing it or validating it on the server to crash or misbehave, just straight up break the system. And finally, and honestly most importantly, a lack of care when handling user uploaded files could easily turn your own project into a platform for attacking other sites and services and users. It's fair to say that you have a responsibility to make sure that your work can't be exploited to attack other people. So I'm going to give you this afternoon a short list of concrete steps to help you solve a complex problem. In order to explain why each step is a good idea, I'll need to give you some examples of just how badly it can go wrong and what you need to be protecting yourself from. And I'm going to give you the last slide of my talk first because I'm a sucker for spoilers. And I'm four seasons behind in Game of Thrones, but I already know like everything that happens. And this is not a mystery show. So here is my advice. And you're welcome to, you know, this is the last talk of the conference. You're welcome to have a beer afterwards. Or you can stay and listen to why it's good advice. Try not to play if you can avoid it. Outsourcing this problem is fantastic. Step one, throw away the entire file name. The file name is not your friend. Step two, always store freshly uploaded files in some kind of quarantine zone that's not in the web root, that is not being served up by the web server. Step three, always very carefully parse and verify the file once it's been uploaded to prove to yourself that it is what it needs to be. And step four, don't keep that file. Copy the parts you care about into a new file that you'll then be hosting. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time explaining why. In order to explain steps one and two, getting rid of file names and storing them somewhere outside the web root, I'm going to explain something about web server software and about some of the assumptions that they've historically made about their threat model. Web servers are probably, I think it's fair to say, the most exposed pieces of software on the planet right now, right? They're hit by requests all day, every day, nonstop, legitimate requests and maliciously crafted ones and corrupt ones and ones from old software, ones that aren't running HTTP2 yet and older horrible HTTP 1.0 stuff. Um, by now, web servers are very resilient to malicious input from outside. Um, still scares me that this sort of key software is written in C, but, um, but it's hardened C. They've been doing this for a long time. Here's the problem. Web server software does expect you to be able to trust the files that it's serving. They've been built with the assumption that any files that they're serving up to a web browser are probably there because you put them there. And sometimes they're configured to execute instructions in those files. So this is like one of the first rules of computer security, right? And it's, it's, almost, it's almost blatantly obvious. If an attacker can upload code and get your computer to run their code, they win, right? It's over. You're done. Um, this is the key premise. So. What are some examples of code that lives inside the web root, something that Apache or Nginx or your web server would serve up that is executed by the web server when it's served? Anybody? PHP, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, you haven't, have you? Um, th but this is the most obvious one. This is the obvious um, first call for complaining about this sort of thing. But it's not the only one. Uh, Apache server-side includes, it's like a built-in template language for the Apache web server. CGI scripts, the old-fashioned you know, web 1.0 way of doing dynamic web apps where a program is actually just run every time a page is requested and the output of the program is returned to the web browser. Active server pages, which is like PHP if you're in the Windows world. It is a programming language, temp templating language that sits inside the web root and is served up. Uh, HT access and configuration directives um, HT access in Apache, which actually changes the configuration of the web server depending on what's being served, and other web browser, other web server software has similar kinds of configuration files sitting inside the web root. And then you've got whatever additions you're actually using in your web server, like Mod Ruby, Mod Perl, Mod Python, etc. So there's a lot of code that might actually happen. If your web server is configured to treat any of these files as special and an attacker can successfully upload any of these files, then they might have a way into your system. 
Now, I'm gonna, in this talk, I'm going to be using PHP as an example a reasonable amount, but this, like I just pointed out, is not a PHP-only issue. It's just that its ubiquity combined with its execution model makes it a really common risk factor, especially in sort of shared hosting environments and, well, you know, all over the place. It's very pervasive. So let's say you have PHP installed, either intentionally or unintentionally, which I'll talk about in a moment. Most default Apache configurations, including on Debian and Ubuntu, um, how many of us do use Debian and Ubuntu as their sort of publishing platform when they're doing web development? Yeah, I mean, again, like most of what I'm talking about is common to a lot of stuff, but these are the systems that I work with, so. Okay. The default configuration in Debian and Ubuntu will execute any files requested with the, ph with the .php file extension as if they were part of your program. So, what do you do? You might assume that you need to block any files with the extension .php from being uploaded and saved to the web root, right? I'll spoil it, yeah, you're right. You need to block those from being run. Trouble is, that same default configuration, and this is the, the locked down configuration that comes by default on Debian and Ubuntu and probably Red Hat, but I didn't actually ever get around to checking, um, also runs as PHP any files with these extensions, PHP 3, PHP 4, PHP 5, PHP 6, PHP 7, PHT, PHPS, and PHTML. And that's, so make sure that your upload checker is blocking all those extensions. Uh, that's the standard conservative configuration provided by distributions. And as you might have heard, the internet is full of bad advice. And so depending on what PHP tutorial you or your administrator or your ops team kind of followed when they were learning about PHP and setting it up, they might have used uh, this snippet of configuration code when setting up their Apache uh, web server. Who's seen this sort of thing before in Apache, right? This is really common. Add handler, tell it it's a PHP script, and look for that extension. It looks really innocent, but it has this wonderful, interesting bonus feature that it doesn't mind if there are multiple extensions on the file. So, now these count as PHP as well. FileName.php.jpg. FileName.php.gif, FileName.php.txt.jpg.gif, FileName.php.whatever-I-want-to-type-here.txt. Um, long story short, if your application code is checking file extensions to decide if a file can be trusted, you could be in a world of pain. It's not going to be enough. What if you're not even using PHP? Like I said, it's not a PHP-only problem, but you'd actually be surprised how often PHP ends up being installed and configured on servers that aren't even using it. Again, if you're in like the Debian Ubuntu world and you've installed your server and you've gone through the server installation and you've gone to the task cell screen and you've selected LAMP stack or you know web application stack for your, um, for your server install, then it will install PHP with that default configuration ready to go. And certainly, even in Python shops, they're often using some kind of PHP as well on their web servers. They might be using it for monitoring, for Nagios, for... Um, oh, and I guess it's P is uh, CGI, isn't it? But you might, you might have a, a WordPress site on the side or something. Your servers may well have it on there without you realizing. So these risk factors apply for any system where the web server is configured to execute code and files that are contained within the document root. And as if that wasn't enough reason for you to never trust the file name or the extension uh, of an uploaded file, here's seven more. File names can do weird things with case. Like, are you sure that your uh, file name checker is case insensitive or case sensitive enough to make sure that it catches those? File names can do other funny things that fool uh, the execution system of the web server. This one in particular used to work on older versions of IIS. So a file might be uploaded and your code would see .jpg, and then when it got saved to disk, it would be file.asp. And ASP is just like PHP. It'll be executed on the way back out. What if your file name has dot dot slash in it? You're fine, you're fine with Django in this case, but um, this will trip things up. And even if you're using Django, which does, I think, check for that on a reasonably strenuous basis, what if it has a mixture of backslashes and forward slashes? Who knows all of the subtleties of Python's handling of forward slashes and backslashes mixed together in a Windows environment where I think it actually allows both to be sort of easily platform compatible? You could find yourself doing fun things. Right. On Windows, 
you still have those historic old, you know, tilde one file name things if the file doesn't match that 8.3 syntax from the old pre-Windows 95 days. You could upload a file like that and it might actually overwrite the file called webconfig.con, which might actually, no, sorry, web.config is the one that that one comes from. All these examples, by the way, are from the OWASP wiki, so again, please, this talk is basically OWASP wiki as interpretive dance, so read up that site, it's good stuff. Files could have any mixture of single or double quotes in them. That could be hilarious when you're shelling out to some other program. Uh, and the poison null byte, which is a hilarious one. So if you're passing this to some sort of uh, backend function that might be exposed in Python but actually implemented in C, are you sure that that's going to handle the null byte in the C code correctly? This one traps, uh, this one used to catch out PHP stuff all the time. So PHP has a lot of file name strings that get passed to backend C functions. And where is that file going to get saved in that case? And finally, you can't trust these file names in the first place because your users screw them up, okay? Most of the time, all, all of us sort of understand the hidden semantic value of file name extensions, but, but lay people don't, right? Like, it's, it's a picture. It's, it's a picture of my grandkids. It's whatever. It's, it's just what happens. You, you can't trust that they are what they say they are, even under the best of times. You've got no choice. You've got to throw the file name away. You can, you can keep it, like keep it in the database, but treat it like untrusted input and don't use it for a file name. If you're saving the file to disk, save it as an anonymous lump of data, maybe with a file name generated from a hash of the contents of the file, you know, just something that you can get, you can find your way back to, but you don't have to rely on the file name as a file name. If you're saving it to an object store like S3, do the same thing. And storing files on S3 is actually a really good idea anyway because it keeps it away from your file system. It, it closes off that whole potential attack vector in the first place. It's always nice to have your code and your data kind of as far away from each other as possible. And it's advantageous because if you throw away the entire file name, it forces you into steps two and three of my, of my four-point safety plan. So you've thrown away the file name. We are now up to those two. You've removed from yourself the temptation of trusting it to tell you anything useful. So now you actually have to, for, you, you're actually forced to look inside the file to prove that it contains what you're expecting. If this is a data ingest and you're expecting a CSV file or something, you actually have to read the file now to see what's inside it. If you're expecting an image file, you actually have to use an image file parser and prove that it opens successfully. So you have to actually guarantee that the file is of a type that you were expecting. So you're totally safe now. No. No, you're really not. Um, reading and parsing potentially malicious files is a dangerous game, and you actually don't really want to be doing it. But if you're going to be serving these files, you, you have to, because the alternative is throwing your users under the bus. Uh, it is your job to protect them from your website. It is not the other way around. The things that can go wrong when you're parsing someone else's files are basically as myriad as the types of files that exist in the world. So that would make this talk a little too long. So here's a couple quick examples. A file could straight up contain a virus, right? They could just upload a file with a virus in it. A compressed file, like an image file or a zip file or anything else, uh, could be crafted to blow out your memory. Um, could be a, uh, you know, a zip file which has five terabytes of zeros in them, which, which I swear I never emailed my friends when, when I was younger. Um, and I'm sure no one in here did. No, everyone, everyone sort of won't make eye contact suddenly. Um, if you're uploading XML, an XML-based file can have all kinds of really nasty things going on, on about it. I think there was a talk by not Tom Eastman about that on, on, on Friday. Um, and actually, if you're handling zip files, then you have all of the above problems all over again, right? Because every single file that's in that zip file could have its own surprises waiting for you. So it's, it's, it's not a fun game. The advice I can give you here is kind of limited because what you need to do depends a lot on your use case and what kind of files you're expecting. You need to be aware of the fail modes of whatever parsers you're using to read uploads. So with things like XML files, you have the problem that 
that, as was pointed out, they're essentially programming languages and the parser is essentially an interpreter. You need to turn off all the features of the parsers that are dangerous on untrusted input. And in Python, the short, the short answer to that is use diffused XML. If you're dealing with untrusted XML or XML that could have come from any surprising source, we actually have a good solution for that here in the Python ecosystem. It's called diffused XML. Uh, Google it, it's cool. Uh, but other, other file types are harder. With images, it's really important to keep your systems up to date and patched because we have a long, long history of really terrible security bugs being found in image parsing libraries. So um, speaking of which, who, who knows what image magic is? Who's unfamiliar with image magic? Just um, cool, okay. So image magic is a ubiquitous suite of image manipulation tools. It's a whole lot of command line tools for annotating images, rescaling images, identifying image file types. It's a very useful suite. It's very scriptable, so it's been in the Unix world for a really long time. A couple months ago, a large number of critical security issues were publicly disclosed and patched in the image li magic library. And these bugs were like worst nightmare scenario bugs. Anyone using image magic to handle an untrusted image was vulnerable to these, and it was trivially easy to ex exploit. So here's an example that would trigger shell execution on your server. Like you send this file to anyone using image magic, and you get to own their computer from now on. And this is the whole file. And this is just a graphics format, and it has a URI in it. That URI got uh, used by, I think it got shelled out to curl, and it didn't have any kind of path checking on it, so you can just start putting shell commands in right here. That's all it took. No buffer overflows, no crazy C stack smashing or, or clever social engineering or anything. It's as anticlimactic as it is devastating. Like That's all it took. Anyone who was behind on their security patching could end up being vulnerable to something like this, something embarrassingly destructive. And antivirus software has a really bad track record with this stuff too. Uh, is anyone familiar with the name Tavis Ormandy? Tavis Ormandy is a researcher uh, for Google. He works on Google's Project Zero, and he has, I guess what must be a dream job for someone like him, where he hacks non-Google software and open source software, and he calls up those companies and explains them how to fix it. So Google is spending a lot of resources in making the internet safer for everybody by hiring some very dangerous people. Fun fact, fun fact. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Tavis found a bunch of severe security vulnerabilities in semantic antivirus uh, a little while ago, and he emailed them to warn them about it. Unfortunately, Symantec uses Symantec to scan all attachments to, um, to, their in co to their corporate email. Their entire email infrastructure crashed when he emailed them. <laughs> so look, like antivirus is actually necessary. Sometimes, sometimes it's a requirement, sometimes you have to be scanning. If you're required to run antivirus software, my recommendation is run it somewhere else. So an option might be have, a, have your antivirus software on a computer where your file upload quarantine is mounted as a read-only um, read uh, network file system or something. Or s if it's not confidential stuff you're being uploaded, there's actually a lot of third-party cloud scanning services that might be really appropriate, assuming it's not confidential information. You don't mind where it goes. But get it away from your application code and get it away from uh, vulnerable things. If that doesn't scare you about opening up and looking at random files that have been uploaded to you, I'm not sure what will. But like I said, if you're receiving files from the internet, this is your job, right? You, you have no choice. You can't make your users do this. So remember step zero, right? The only winning move is not to play. This must be the point where you're sort of starting to think that maybe, maybe using a third-party service like Gravatar or, or Libravatar to handle those profile pictures instead of just letting people upload images to your site willy-nilly. Keep your tools up to date. Keep your security patches current, and keep your parsers and file ingest mechanisms conservative, paranoid, and stupid. Right? Let make them throw away anything that doesn't look right. I go through this whole talk, and I usually forget to mention that, you know, if someone's uploading a profile photo, they could just upload a DVD image. Right? What if they just upload five gigabytes of stuff at you? There, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of little things that you just want to make sure they just can't mess with you. Uh, for bonus points, 
again, I'm still sort of talking in Debian and Ubuntu, use AppArmor profiles. Or if you're in the Red Hat world, use SE Linux. Use some of these new security mechanisms that we actually have access to these days. It might qualify as a bit of an extra credits assignment. AppArmor is a Linux security technology that restricts a program's capabilities. So it's functionally, for example, you would create an AppArmor profile that says, this program is allowed to open you know, its shared libraries, its requirements, and it's allowed to look at files in my upload quarantine. But if it tries to open a network connection or start a subshell, kill it. So going back to that image magic example that we had a moment ago, a well-crafted AppArmor profile would have actually probably preemptively protected you from the worst that that could, that that could do because you would set up a profile that says, this is a program that looks at images. It doesn't need to shell out and run ls. It doesn't need to run commands. So if it does do that, notify me and, and kill it. So the second image magic behaves in an unexpected way. Process would be killed. A warning would be generated in your log files, which maybe you'll even read one day. It's cool stuff. I, I really like this stuff. And it's worth learning about if you're a paranoid systems geek, like I'm hopefully, hopefully turning you all into right now. Okay, so where were we? You're all very sleepy. Where are we? We are up to step four. Cool. I'm sorry. I'm like the last person keeping everyone from beer, aren't I? Sorry. Um, okay. The idea here is that you never serve the original uploaded file. You built a new one yourself that isn't a straight copy of it. The most simple example that demonstrates what I mean is image files again. Uh, once you've validated that it is actually a JPEG that you've received, don't just put it in place for re-hosting. Instead, create a new JPEG with the same picture in it, uh, either, either by re-encoding the file or rescaling the image, which you know, you're probably going to do anyway. right? Like, if you're dealing with image files, this is usually a no-brainer, because you're probably going to generate thumbnails and scaled versions of the file. Um, or maybe, you maybe convert the file to another format completely. There's two goals that you kind of want to achieve when you're doing this. You guarantee that you're the ones, you're hosting files that you built. Uh, you know that it has the data you need and that you want to present to your users. And you're a lot safer with the assumption that it doesn't have any unpleasant surprises. Um, sorry, yep. And secondly, you've successfully thrown away any data that you didn't need or didn't care about because your parser didn't even notice it. So JPEG files also provide a good example here. By tampering with the image yourself, you might break any last malicious content that might have been in there. Like, you know, image magic isn't the only thing that's been hit with security bugs in image libraries. Both Android and Apple have been hit with really bad ones within the last year. Um, and by tampering with the image yourself, you might be protecting users on mobile devices, or you might be pr protecting users who don't have their own um, who haven't been as good with security patches as you have been. So forget about exploits for a second. It's also just good data hygiene. So like, imagine your user is uploading a picture, and that picture contains an EXIF header. And that header includes, say, like the GPS coordinates of the location the picture was taken. That's pretty common. Most of our phones embed GPS coordinates in photos. But it's a potential data leak that your user possibly neither expected nor desired, right? So if you don't care about that data, if there's no compelling reason for the hosted image to have it, it should be removed as a routine part of your upload processing. This is a fun example. This photo was published on Google Plus uh, two months ago to demonstrate the new phone, the new uh, Huawei P9 smartphone, which I've seen billboards for all over the place. That is a Beautiful photo from a, um, from a smartphone. Now, Google Plus preserved all of the uh, EXIF data. It had, it had all, of the, um, all of the EXIF tags on it. So because of that, <laughs> <coughs> it might not necessarily have been the phone that took the photo. If you can't read that at the back, that says Canon EOS 5D Mark III, which is actually a really great camera. Um, so always be on the side of your user's discretion. Don't, don't be like Google+. <laughs> so we're back where we started. 
I hope what I managed to do is give you some food for thought and some ideas on how to make both yourself and your users safer. So write beautiful code, be careful out there, and, and, and always be on the lookout for new ways you can disappoint bad people. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. We have time for one question. Oh, one. There's a short person up the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in, in terms of patching software, I've taken particular delight in looking at specific CVEs, and I do, and finding they don't patch, um, get patched in vendor distributions because they're user space. How do you look at those types of libraries and get them patched? Because package managers don't always pick up those security fixes. When you say vendor libraries, um, are you, sorry, you're referring to the, dis not the distributions, but... So for example, a, a particular database driver within a language mm. is often a separate package within a distribution. Gotcha. Uh, and because those are separate packages, they're not necessarily um, core to the distribution. So I found them sort of marked as um, will not fix Oh user yeah, space. so so just to give you a, just to give you an example of this, um, like Ubuntu has a very wide package selection in their main repository in, in their repositories, but their repositories are separated between main, which they guarantee support for, and universe, which is called community supported. And community supported, as I understand it, means let's hope Debian patches it. Um, now you've got to maintain some vigilance on that. So I always recommend using you know, supported operating systems and supported LTS versions of things. But that's not, a, that's not always enough. You actually need to know um, if your package is being supported by someone else. But assume it's not. You know, this, is, this is a process, this is an ops process that is actually getting a lot worse in the world of Docker and user so and developer supplied things. There's a gap that needs to be bridged there. Um, and there are tools slowly filling that space. Uh, Ubuntu has, for example, a tool which I can't remember the name of, but we'll tweet it out. Um, it is for looking at the support lifetime of every Ubuntu package you have installed. So at least in their metadata for their packages now, um, they'll tell you this is an LTS one and it has secure support for like two years or this is a universe package. Um, I got caught out by this recently because WordPress is not in main, right? So if you're using WordPress and I always, I always think it's a better idea to use um, distribution supported packages, but WordPress isn't one. It's there. You can go apt get install WordPress, but it's not in the main distribution on Ubuntu. So you might not get timely security updates with it. Um, you need to make sure you have some defined process for inventoring, inventor, inventorizing, keeping track of the crap you're using. <laughs> um, and yeah, watch out for CVEs. Someone has to have that job and all you need to do is go home to your company, go home to your project, ask who has that job. And if no one has that job, you need to have a conversation about it. Thank you. And that's all the time we have. Let's thank Tom again.